I'm going to be over in Genesis 29 and uh, preaching there, but let me first bring a uh, greetings from your university, Oklahoma's Baptist University over in Shawnee, Oklahoma, which belongs to the Southern Baptist Churches of Oklahoma, reports to and is accountable to the churches, Southern Baptist Churches of Oklahoma. God's blessing with uh, another fantastic year of enrollment. Marvelous things going on. I, I, could, I could tell you a lot of exciting things, including the 2014 rankings that just came out of U.S. News and World Report. Your university is the highest ranked in the state of Oklahoma. Uh, I could tell you about uh, Princeton Review's 2014 rankings that just came out a couple of weeks ago, naming OBU best in the West. But here's the one that I get most excited about. Uh, Tom Elliff informed me a couple of months ago that again this year, there are more missionaries serving around the world who have a degree from Oklahoma Baptist University than any other university in the world. That's from your university. I should have said too, I appreciate that story about the Assemblies of God. I have, my granddad is a Baptist, retired Baptist minister, lives over in Moore, and uh, his dad, my great granddad, was a, his, uh, was a Southern Baptist minister over in western Oklahoma. In fact, when I was in college, I heard him preach, uh, and he was over 100 at the time, still doing a little supply work. And, uh, and so that's, uh, that's part of my heritage. But my great-granddaddy on my mama's side was Pentecostal holiness preacher. So I'm a Southern Baptist who knows how to say, Holy Ghost! <laughs> so I, I, I've just felt real at home today. I appreciate that. In Genesis 29 is a story of someone we're all familiar with, pretty vaguely, but, but most of us are sort of familiar with her or the story that surrounds her. When you, when you think of this uh, person, you are likely to come up with uh, uh, adjectives to describe her or even personal feelings of sorrow for her, but you, you, would, you would think of adjectives like sad and poor and and uh, pitiful and unloved, and those of you that have the King James inspired version, even the word despised might come to mind. Her name was Leah, and Leah was uh, a person for whom the vast majority of those who know anything about her would describe with the, with the, with the precursor, poor Leah, poor, poor Leah, sad, Leah. Uh, Leah endured, a, a, no doubt, a childhood that was probably filled with pain because she had a pretty little sister who overshadowed her. And, uh, and in fact, when we see what uh, words are used to describe Leah in the Word of God, we, we, read, we, words, we read words like weak-eyed. Uh, or some translations, weak on the eyes. That's even more painful, isn't it? Uh, plain comes to mind when you think of Leah. Uh, the plain older sister. Even her name in the old Hebrew is uh, said to mean wild cow, while Rachel, her little sister's name, was meant uh, as little ewe lamb, E-W-E, ewe. Um, you, you get the feeling that Rachel just sort of lived her whole life in the shadow of her little sister. By the way, in many ways, I am Leah. I have twin sisters that are 20 months younger than me, and uh, little blonde, blue-eyed, beautiful little girls growing up. Now they're beautiful, young, 50-year-old women. But uh, they, uh, I grew up my whole life in the shadow of my little sisters. One time my, my sister said to me, I've always called them the girls, and uh, I would say, hey, girls, come here. And, and uh, one of them said, this is as an adult. She said, you know, David, that hurts my feelings. And I said, it does. Well, why is that? She said, because I have an identity. And, uh, and my whole life, you don't know what it's like, she said. My whole life, I've been one of the girls or one of the twins. And uh, she looked at me expecting, you know, the understanding of an older, wiser brother. And uh, basically, I looked at her and said, get real. I have no empathy whatsoever for that. She said, why? And I said, uh, because I'm doubly separated from my identity. You are one of the twins. I was the twins' brother. So, so I, I know what it's like to live in the shadow of pretty little twins. This is, this is the, 
This is the move I saw most often at a family reunion. It was this. Uh, it was, well, hello, David. Oh, would you look at the twins, right? And, and, and so I kind of relate to Leah. She, she, she is the one that was just sort of overlooked. In fact, the very first verse we're going to read about her says that she was unloved. Uh, the, the old King James, I believe, says despised. Uh, not, a very, not a very encouraging thing. But I want, by the end of our sermon this morning, for you to walk away thinking these words about Leah. What a wonderful life. Because Leah, indeed, had a wonderful life. In fact, she ought to be one of your heroes. She's one of my heroes. Uh, I, I want you to see her through the, through the eyes of her own faith. Uh, we don't know much about her. Most of everything we know about her is in Genesis 39 and 40. She's mentioned again over in Genesis 49, and she's mentioned in the New Testament, but, but generally just in passing. Most of what we know is read in these uh, in chapters 39 and 40, and, and it paints a picture that's kind of sad unless, unless you pay attention to what's going on in her life as she bears uh, four, five, six sons. Eight sons are ultimately credit to her account in their culture, but she personally bore six sons to her husband Jacob. And with those sons, uh, each one there is a statement about, the, about her uh, spiritual heart, and uh, there is a naming of the son which was very significant because it revealed her hope and her spiritual maturity. And so we're just going like, to look at the life of Leah and I hope you'll come to the conclusion that Leah had a most wonderful life. We'll begin reading in chapter, 30, uh, chapter 29. I've been saying 39 and 40. I meant 29 and 30. Chapter 29 of Genesis. We'll start reading with verse 31. Genesis 29 verse 31. When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. So Leah conceived and bore a son, and, he call, and she called his name Reuben, for she said, The Lord has surely looked on my affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. Here is a confession, a, a, a sad confession. My husband doesn't love me. Maybe now he will that I've borne him a son. And to understand this, it probably would be good just to step back for a minute and, and, and look at how we got to this point and, why, and who is Rachel in this story and, and why is she popping up in this story of her marriage. Well, the sad reality is Jacob was married to sisters, a whole dysfunctional family that's not the purpose of this sermon, but uh, in that culture was not that unusual. And the way that that happened was this. You know the story. Let me just give you a quick reminder uh, one day Leah's life uh, and Rachel's life was about to change. You see, Rachel was out watering the ewes, the little lambs, and met this wealthy, handsome, young heir to Abraham. Um, uh, the, the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they would have been fairly famous. I mean, Abraham had developed quite a name for himself and was an extremely wealthy man. And his heir had been Isaac. And now the heir of Isaac, his name is Jacob, has been sent by his mother to their very land to find a wife. He's actually hiding out from Esau, and that's another story too. But he's been sent there to find a wife, and not just to their part of the country to find a wife, but to the house of Laban, their father. You, 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 you got to see this, uh, this picture unfolding of Rachel rushing home and uh, all excited, and everybody comes out to see what the racket is about. And she begins to tell the story of meeting this handsome, this wealthy, young uh, uh, man who has come from a far country. He's the heir of Abraham and Isaac and he's been sent to find a wife from among their house. You know who would have been the most excited of all? Leah. She was the older sister. It would have been customary for her to be married to this man. This is, this is somebody that was meant for her. She knows it. She has it in her heart and, and there's every indication to believe that when she meets Jacob, she falls in love with him. She's smitten. And she wants him to love her so much. And over the next few months, uh, Laban hosts Jacob in their home. And Leah apparently really falls hard for him. But 
is either ignorant of or ignores the stolen glances between Jacob and Rachel. For Jacob has become smitten with her pretty little sister. A deal is struck, a dowry is determined, and, and, and an agreement between Laban, the father, and Jacob for the hand of his daughter in marriage. Jacob is so in love with Rachel, he agrees that he'll work for seven years' labor in, ter- in, in return for the hand of uh, Rachel. But he's tricked. The old trickster himself is duped by Laban. And after seven years of labor, the wedding is held. And uh, you know the story. Uh, the ceremony is held, and uh, here comes the bride. She would have been, she would have been dressed in all of the robes and, and uh, the veil over her face, and and uh, the 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 announcement uh, of marriage is made, and she's taken to the marriage tent with Jacob. And the next morning, Jacob wakes up and doesn't see a little ewe lamb, but a wild cow with him, and he's up and he's unhappy. And he confronts Laban. Why, why did you do this? I, I, I'm in love with Rachel. And Laban, uh, basically, this is the Whitlock paraphrase. Well, of course you had to understand. I had to marry the oldest one off first. i tell you what we'll do. He said, uh, you work another seven years. You, you, you agree to these two conditions and you can also have Rachel. You work for me another seven years and you complete the marriage week with Leah. In other words, you stay married to Leah uh, you stay joined with her and you work for seven more years and you can also have Rachel and Jacob agreed. And so now we find a man with a dysfunctional family in so many ways, but uh, with, uh, with two women uh, that uh, both are having a similar struggle. One has something that the other one wants. Each of them does. And uh, Rachel has the love of her husband, but she wants children. Leah, we find, uh, gives birth and begins to have children, and she longs for and desires the love of her husband and doesn't have it. And so she bears this son in verse 32 and names him Reuben, for she said, The Lord has surely looked on my affliction. Uh, Maybe now my husband will love me. That's sad, isn't it? Maybe now he'll love me. In other words, there's this confession that she doesn't have what she desires the most. She does not have the love of her husband. Uh, And yet there is this uh, expression of faith. We see a little bit of her spiritual life. uh, and, And she says, I'll name this son Reuben, literally meaning God sees. I don't have the love of my husband, but I have something. And that is, I know that God sees me. Folks, that is a, that's powerful. Um, I, I, I have uh, t- told this story a few times. I'll give the very short version. I got news one uh, morning that my folks uh, were, were going to divorce, and I was pretty upset by it. And for a week or so, I just moped around. And I was eating lunch one day and sat over in the far corner at a, at a table all by myself. Didn't want to visit with anybody. And this girl that I'd seen around school, her name was Donna, but uh, outside of her name, I just really didn't know her at all. We had probably said three words to each other, hi and uh, bye, or, or uh, nodded at each other in, the, in hallways and around the campus. But uh, she came and sat right across from me. You ever just kind of want to be by yourself and pout and somebody butts in? And uh, I was over there picking up my food, and she sat down across from me, didn't say a word, just sat and began to eat. And a little, little, little while went by, and she said, I, I understand your folks um, threw you a curveball. And uh, I didn't even look up. I just said, yep. And she said, uh, yeah, I know what that's like. Two years ago, my parents threw me the same curveball. That was all she said. I s- sat and picked at my food. Uh, a little while later, we got up and uh, walked our different ways and probably had another three words over the next several years that we knew each other. And yet, I'll tell you, I was so encouraged that day because here she is two years later, and she's just fine. Uh, she's survived. In fact, she seems to be a happy person. 
I'm going to make it. Uh, there was something in knowing that you're not alone and that someone else knows how much better in the case of Leah that she realizes not only that she's not alone. I, I know my husband doesn't love me. Maybe now he will. I'm going to name this son an expression of my faith. God sees. How much better than, uh, than, a, than a, a casual acquaintance knowing what you're going through. As powerful as that was in my life. How much better knowing that the God of the universe hasn't forgotten you. Whatever your situation, uh, uh, fellow believer, whatever the hardship that you may be going through, whatever it is that you don't have that you desire and are hoping for and longing for and still yet it's out of your reach, you, you can be sure of this. God sees. He knows. And sometimes that is sufficient. Amen? Well, second, she has a second son. We'll pick up in verse 33. She conceived again and bore a son and said, because the Lord has heard that I am unloved, he's therefore given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. I'm really liking Leah. She, she understands that no matter what her circumstance is, that God sees her. She's not forgotten. But now we see a, a, an even deeper expression of her, of her faith and her spiritual life. She, she has another son and she, she says, maybe, maybe now he'll love me. I still don't have what I desire the most. Uh, and yet God has heard my prayer. And she names her son Simeon, literally meaning God hears. You, you see, she understands not only does God see her where she is and what her need is, but that God hears her cries out to him. How much better for us as believers, regardless of our circumstance, to know that God sees us. And even better than that, if we cry out to him, he hears us. We're not alone. God sees us. You got a bad situation? Cry out to him. And you'll be able to confess like Leah. Not only do you see me, Lord, but you'll hear my prayers. God sees. God hears. And then she conceived again and bore a son and said, Now this time my husband will become attached to me because I've borne him three sons. Therefore she named him Levi. His name was called Levi. Now this time my husband will become attached to me. There is a confession there. He still is not joined with me. And yet there is this hope. And, and it's expressed in the naming of this son. God attaches or God joins Levi. God, God is the one who fixes. She recognizes that I can't fix this, but God can. Uh, you, could, you, could, you could say the that the message here is God joins or only God can join. Or, or you could say the message here is that God fixes. Both of them, I think, are correct. Because if you've got a situation that seems unbearable, not only can you have faith that God sees you, not only do you have faith that if you cry out to Him, as did Leah, that God will hear your prayers and answer you, but you can also confess with Leah that even though things aren't right, I know that God fixes. Even though I'm not joined, I know that God and only God can join. By the way, there's a whole other sermon to be preached here on, uh, on marriage. And uh, I'm going to not preach the whole message, but let me, I'd be remiss if I didn't just mention it. Now, my wife uh, loves marriage retreats. We've been to one uh, because that's the only one she was able to get me to go to. Maybe one and a half. I, I don't remember. But I, I don't like them. Uh, she'll say, let's go. Let, there's this marriage retreat. And I'll say, tell you what, I'll save you $125. I'm wrong. I'm a creep. I did everything wrong. I'm sorry. I'll do better. I mean, it's always the husband's fault, right? Well, here's the deal. Uh, here, here's a little marriage retreat in two minutes. Uh, I'm convinced that one of the uh, whole sermon can be preached on this, but one of the messages here is that she, she is legally married and still doesn't feel joined uh, to her husband. It's possible to be in a marriage and not feel attached. And I believe at the risk of alienating all my brethren, I believe it is the man's responsibility to join with the wife 
because our pattern in marriage, one of the reasons we as uh, Christians believe that marriage is so special and so sacred and uh, that we defend marriage is not just for all the, 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 the uh, reasons that's put out on the news, but it is also and primarily because it is a picture of the relationship of Jesus and the church. It is the highest form that we can participate in that, that uh, pictures and illustrates and gives testimony to the love of Jesus and the church he died for. We're called the bride uh, of Christ as the church and he's called the bridegroom and, and uh, we're, we're told that in the end uh, we'll, we'll all gather together for a marriage feast and everything about the marriage points to Jesus and the church and so it's special and sacred. And here's the thing, if marriage is a picture of the love of Jesus, in fact, Jesus even, uh, the, the Word of God even teaches this, doesn't it, in the New Testament. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. You, you need to be willing to lay down your life for her. And, and, and wives, love your husband as, as the church loves the Lord, the head of the church, right? We, we have all that pattern. And if that's true, then husbands, our responsibility is to act like Jesus. And Jesus didn't expect the bride to come into his world and, and, and suddenly adapt to his world of football and basketball and hot dogs and Fritos and cards and all of that stuff. He entered our world, the bride's world, didn't he? He, he came into our world uh, and we ought to be entering into the world of our wives else they'll never feel attached to us. It's your responsibility and then I'll move on. Uh, all the ladies said... And all the men said, I really thought he was a pretty nice guy until that. Well, here, one, one last thing for young people in this room, because God joins together, here, here's, here's a, a one-sentence sermon. If you're not married, you have no right as a believer in Jesus Christ, as a follower in Jesus Christ, you have no right. In fact, I think you're being disobedient if you're dating someone who is not a believer in Jesus Christ. That's, that's serious stuff. You don't, even, you don't even mess around with that. Well, now I've got the young people ticked off at me. Verse 35, she conceived again and bore a son and said, Now I will praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah. She stopped bearing, at least for a while. Fourth son, there's only six we're going to talk about. Fourth son, Judah. She, she, she makes this, uh, this statement. Now I will praise the Lord. No indication that she has what she wants. No indication that Jacob has begun returning her love or has entered into her world and joined with her, has become attached to her. She still doesn't have what her heart's desire is. And yet with the birth of this fourth son, she seems to have made a discovery that unfortunately most Christians sadly never make. And, and it is this. She comes to the conclusion and by the naming of this son expresses that conclusion that Jesus is to, that God is to be praised. I'm going to name this son Judah, meaning praise the Lord, praise Jehovah. What, what she realizes is that it really doesn't matter what her situation is. He deserves her praise. Why? Not because of situations, but because he's God and he deserves praise, regardless of what the situation is. Amen? And, 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 and it's the reason that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego could say, you throw us into the furry, fiery furnace, you, you throw us in there, our God is able to deliver us. Amen? And even, they said, even if He doesn't, we're still going to praise Him. Even if He doesn't. It's why Job could, could say, even though He slay me, still I'll not dishonor Him. I'll not turn my back on Him. I'll not curse God and die. Even if he kills me, I won't do it. Isn't that incredible? I had a, a, at a Southwest Baptist where I worked for almost 10 years, I followed uh, in the office of a gentleman named Michael Awad who had been the associate provost before me. And he, he was a, a Palestinian Christian who grew up in Jerusalem. And uh, when he was a little boy in the 40s, 
uh, his dad and uh, his grandfather and his great-grandfather had brought them up in the admonition and love of Jesus Christ. They were uh, multi-generation, multi-generational followers of Jesus. And uh, with the uh, uh, changing world after World War II, that land was designated for Israel. And, uh, and, and so a lot, of, a lot of people were displaced. And uh, his family was one that had to leave the home that they had owned for multiple generations. Uh, because it had been given uh, to establish the new nation of Israel. And, and the, the day came, he said, when the soldiers came and knocked on the door and said to his father, Mr. Awad, it's time to go. And he said, uh, all of us sat around the table watching intently to discover what our father, who brought us up to love Jesus and to love the people of Jesus, the Jews, what would his reaction be now that we were being uh, evicted from our multi-generational home? And he said they watched and his father stood up, looked at, the, looked at them around the table and uttered these words, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And he led his family out. That's the kind of faith that Leah is expressing here. She's still distraught. She's still hurting. But she comes to the conclusion that it doesn't matter in good times or bad times. If he delivers us or if he doesn't deliver us. If he heals me or he slays me. He deserves praise because He's God, and God deserves praise regardless of my situation. That ought to be the point that we come to as Christians. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Why? Because He's God, and He's marvelous, and He's wonderful. Oh, I'm starting to really like Leah. She, she seems to really get something and, and, and she's becoming my hero. And, 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 and then we, we enter a part of the story in chapter 30 that is another sermon for another time. It'll be a sermon on dysfunctional families. She and her sister get into a, into a, a, a match and they give their handmaidens, their servants to their husband and four other children are born. Two credited to Rachel, two credited to, credited to uh, uh, Leah, and then uh, Leah uh, decides that uh, God has uh, rewarded her by doing that. I, I, I'm convinced that she doesn't really understand what the reward was for, but I am convinced that he rewards her, and she becomes pregnant again. And if you'll look over in chapter 30, verse 17, you'll read about that fifth son. And God listened to Leah, and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. Leah said, God has given me my wages because I've given my maid to my husband. So she called his name Issachar, meaning God rewards or God gives wages. Whether she understood the real reason behind that, scholars will debate. But she uttered a truth, and that is that God does reward. God does give just wages. Either way you interpret that. God gives just wages or God rewards. Or God rewards you with the wages that you've earned. That, that statement is not only true, but it'll either haunt you or it'll bless you. Listen. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, Emmanuel we sing of, came to earth, took on the form of man. Incredible. He lived a perfect life. He satisfied all the laws. He fulfilled all of the laws of God. And as such was a perfectly qualified once and for all suitable sacrifice for our sin. And He gave His life for us. He died on a cross. He was crucified and buried. And three days later He rose again. And for 40 odd days he ministered and was witnessed by hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. At one point, over 500 saw him. It was, it was indisputable. And then in the presence of his followers, he ascended into heaven with the promise that like I'm leaving in bodily form, someday I'll return. 
And when I return, I'm going to gather you all together. And I'm going to put those on my right and those on my left. And the ones on my right are going to be ushered into my kingdom. And the ones on my left will be given their just rewards. Their just wages. The Bible, said all, the Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Well, here she's making a statement, God rewards. God gives just wages. And the day is coming. And, and, and Jesus himself said, Behold, I'm coming quickly and I'm bringing with me my reward my just wages. For those on his left, you get what you earned. In fact, to those on my left, Jesus says, you get your heart's fondest desire. You wanted to be free from me. Now it's permanent. And to those on his right, he says, behold, I bring you your reward. God has given everything to me. The Father has given me everything. And when you expressed your faith in me, you became a joint heir with me. What's mine is yours. Oh, let this, let this statement of Leah as a believer or a non-believer in this church in 2013 either bless you or absolutely scare the dickens out of you. If you've, if you've believed in Jesus as your Savior, I got good news. He's bringing a reward, and it's, and it's the reward that everything that's His is yours. But if you've not yet placed your life in the hands of Jesus, if you've not yet repented of your sin, asked forgiveness, and expressed faith in Christ Jesus as the sacrifice for your own sins, then, then let that haunt you. Because it may just be that at any moment He comes to you and says... You rejected me. You wanted to live apart from me. You wanted nothing to do with me. You get it. You get your heart's fondest desire. You get your just wages. Death, hell, permanent apartness from me. Oh, Leah understood something when she named that child Issachar. God rewards. Let it haunt you or let it bless you. Verse 19, Leah conceived again and bore Jacob a sixth son. And Leah said, God has endowed me with a good endowment. Now my husband will dwell with me because I've borne him six sons. So she called his name Zebulun. Zebulun, meaning God endows. Uh, 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 she still doesn't have what she wants. She's still expressing her heart's fondest desire. Maybe now, maybe now with six sons, He'll dwell with me. Maybe now he'll, he'll, he'll enter my world. Maybe now he'll, he'll return my love. And yet I'm going to name this son Zebulun, meaning God has endowed. The, 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 the word that might be uh, better understood in our, in our uh, world today is God has honored me. Uh, uh, God has given me an honor. I like endowment, though. I, I am a college president. And, uh, and any time I can work endowment into a sermon, uh, I'll do that. And by the way, I'll be available. We've got Kim Coe here. She's going to visit with students. And I'm available any time anybody wants to do an endowment. Let me tell you what the beautiful thing about an endowment is. <laughs> I'm, I'm treading on thin ice here, Kurt. Let me tell you the beautiful thing about an endowment. It's permanent. It's a blessing that is permanent and keeps on blessing year after year after year after year until Jesus comes. That's what Lee is saying. That's why I like the term endowment. God, you have given me an endowment, an honor, an endowment that is permanent and that keeps on blessing me year after year after year, day after day after day after day. In perpetuity, you've blessed me. You've honored me in perpetuity, a, a forever kind of blessing. I named this son endowment or blessing. And it's, and it's given in great honor. Endowment is given to, to honor a person uh, in perpetuity. 
I, I love that language. And I love Leah. She, she, she's saying, uh, what like paraphrase, God, I still don't have the honor of my husband. But God, you honor me. You honor me with a perpetual honor and blessing. Listen, there are a lot of people in this church even who work and labor and pray and do the kinds of things that no one ever sees behind the scenes, never up here preaching or never up here uh, leading. And you don't get the the applause and you don't get the recognition and your name isn't on the church bulletin. God sees and God honors you. And that's enough. That's better than the honor of some clapping, isn't it? Whatever your situation, whatever the hurt Whatever the thing is that you desire to have more than anything else and yet you still don't have. Whatever the challenge is that you're facing right now. I I want you to let Leah be an encouragement. God sees. God hears. God joins. God fixes. God is to be praised regardless. God rewards And God honors. Leah had a wonderful life as told in these pages. But there's a couple of other things I want to say about Leah and then we'll be through. I'm personally convinced that Leah got her prayer answered. I'm personally convinced that Leah did indeed see the return of Jacob's love. And I'm basing that not just on uh, speculation, uh, a certain amount of logic, uh, a certain amount of speculation, but I think it's logically deduced. And then on one last verse about her. The first, this logically deduced conclusion that uh, she got the love of Jacob. You'll recall that uh, her sister Rachel ended up having two sons, Joseph uh, who was sold into slavery because of jealousy and lived to, and uh, actually lived to, uh, to spare the entire family and the entire nation of Egypt. And they were all reunited back in Egypt and lived there until Jacob died. Uh, you know that story. And then she bore another son, Rachel, uh, Rachel did, whose name was Benjamin. And she died during childbirth. Well, see, Rachel and Leah weren't that far apart in years. And Rachel's still bearing children. I want you to see that they're still young women at this point. They're still relatively young women. Who was the young woman who then became the principal and only wife of Jacob? It was Leah. Who who then was the one who became the one wife who raised Benjamin and Joseph and all the others. It was Leah. Who was it that grew old with Jacob? It was Leah. So I think logically you could say that there came a point where they dwelt together, where they were joined. But I'm basing that not just on logic, but on a, on a thing, on something that Jacob says on his deathbed. They're in Egypt. They've been saved from drought. Jacob has lived a good long life and as an old man is about to die and he calls all of his sons, all 12, to his bedside and he begins to speak to them. He prophesies over each one of them. It was a moving moment, this deathbed scene. And then in chapter 49, you can go read it verbatim later, but in chapter 49, he makes an interesting statement He says, I'm about to be gathered to my fathers, to my people. I'm about to die. Don't bury me here in Egypt. Bury me back in the promised land. Bury me back in Canaan. And then he gave very specific instructions as to where. 
there, he said in chapter 49, verses 29 through 31, he charged them and said to them, I'm to be gathered to my people, bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre, in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field of Ephron the Hittite as a possession for a burial place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah, his wife. And there I buried Leah. Rachel was buried on the road on the way to Bethlehem. But when Leah died some years before this moment, he buried her in the family tomb. He buried her in the place of honor. Bury me not here. Bury me back in the family tomb in the promised land, he says. Promise me, and his sons did. There is Abraham buried with his beloved wife, Sarah. There is where Isaac is buried with his beloved wife, Rebecca. Bury me with my beloved wife, Leah. Oh, I have a feeling someday when we get to glory and after a few eons of just thanking Jesus, when we get around to thinking, well, I might like to go visit somebody. I have a strong suspicion there'll be a long line at the mansion of Leah, this marvelous person who bore six of the 12 tribes of Israel, including the oldest, a place of significance, including Levi, the priestly tribe, the tribe of Moses, and including Judah, through which God the Father chose to bring forth the only begotten Son, Jesus. In Revelation called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Oh, you see, Jesus' earthly line goes back not through Rachel, but through Leah. And I tell you that Leah had a wonderful life, and so can you. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this marvelous person, Leah, and the truths that she and her story teach us in your word. Father, for those who trust you and are called by the name Christ and are followers of Jesus, I pray that you let Leah be an encouragement to them that God sees whatever their situation, whatever their hurts, whatever their fears, whatever their needs are, God sees and God hears, God fixes, and God is to be praised for God rewards and God honors. Father, help them hang on and to be encouraged. Help them to stay the course, to stick it out, to persevere, to stay true, to keep on praying. And Father, if there are those here this morning who've never trusted Christ, who've never turned their life over to you, who've never asked forgiveness, who've never placed their faith in the one who died on the cross for them, I pray that even now you give them faith that they might start this marvelous journey of faith in Christ. And I pray it all in the name of Jesus. May your will be done. Amen.